today is E4M DNPA Digital Media. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we are all set for our second panel for the day on digital media and its social impact. Joining us for this session, once of course the stage is set, will be our session chair. Thank you, just doing my job right here. And I hand over the session, of course, to the session right. chair to kindly take the discussion forward. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Pranay Upadhyay and uh, uh, the, the afternoon sessions in any such event are the most challenging one to hold the attention because they are prior to lunch. And, uh, but I can assure you that uh, if you sit tight for the next 40, 45 minutes, you are going to have a very uh, interesting overview and very good takeaways because this is the most diverse panel one could have uh, because we have on one side Mr. Vijay Chadha who, is, who has almost lived three lives, three professional lives, an ex-army officer to uh, a ambient air quality activist. And on the other side we have uh, Shreya Kapoor, the youngest content creator. Uh, so such a diverse experience we have. And uh, most of them you know very well, uh, they are the known influencers, speakers, so I don't have to waste my time in, in their formal introduction. And uh, one seat is vacant for Arjuna, we are waiting for Arjuna to join us. But uh, let me start the discussion uh, with this thing uh, and I'll be throwing uh, questions. So some uh, the basic uh, housekeeping thing would be that our session would be divided into three segments. One question to each of my panelists and uh, then we'll keep it free for some of their comment and the informed audience here can also ask questions. So, uh, in last eight to ten years, we all have seen tremendous change in terms of the technology and the digital landscape. And today, we are the one of the fastest digitized economy, the fastest uh, digitized world, and the most populous country. Uh, probably, we might be after the census. So. Uh, Mr. Arvind Gupta, I would want to start this discussion with you that with 84 crore or 840 million connected citizens, we talk about building the digital highways in India and making it more uh, like, you know, connected. But is this digital, digitized India more inclusive and democratic or are we becoming more chaotic and divided? So thank you, Pranay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, Two things. I think let me just give you um, uh, a little bit of an overview of what you asked and in, uh, in a few uh, comments. Number one, India is of course the biggest free internet market in the world. 850 million or 85 crore internet users globally uh, in India with, the, with three clear uh, uh, characteristics. Number one, uh, the lowest data anywhere in the world. The data cost in India is the lowest anywhere in the world. Also the highest per, per capita data consumption, bandwidth consumption is the highest in India. Eight years ago, this we used to be 155th. So from 155th in the list, we are now top in the list of lowest data, highest data consumption, lowest cost, highest consumption. Two, the clear trend in India and that's why it's inclusive. And it won't be possible because 86% of the Indians don't, speak, uh, don't understand what I'm speaking, the English language. Right? So uh, if 86% of Indians are on the digital highway, they won't be without the three Vs working. The three Vs are uh, vernacular, local languages, voice, and video. Without that, this, this revolution ain't, ain't happening. And the third thing is this consumer is now spread all across, all across the income pyramid. So from the lowest strata of societies, the below poverty line, to the aspirational class, to the middle class, to the top class. Uh, I mean, the aspirational onwards, everybody has a, has a smartphone. Even the lower strata, the below poverty line, there is at least one or two users in a family who have smartphone connectivity. Very inclusive. And I'll give you one, two examples which will tell you that. Um, how many in this room, how many in this room have not got their vaccines? The answer should be zero, right? Hopefully. Uh, and, and the reason, uh, and one of the things that we proud, pride ourselves is that we can get our vaccine certificate on a WhatsApp connection. Anybody knows that you can get your vaccine certificate on a WhatsApp? Anybody? If you're not, please figure it out. The number is 901305155. Uh, you send a WhatsApp to that number, you will get 
uh, a, a message which says that get schedule an appointment, download your certificate, whatever, whatever you want to do. Now, why I say that here? There are two things in that, Pranay, which are important. One, number one is India has built the biggest digital inclusion platforms in the world today, what are called digital public goods, whether it's UPI, COVIN. This is an example of COVIN. COVIN is our vaccination platform, but the front end is WhatsApp. Now, the, one of the secrets to reach a billion users, 2.2 billion doses, was the ease of using the small WhatsApp chatbot to get your scheduling done and get your vaccination certificates in your own language. So the principles I just told you were applied here. Now it made it more inclusive. Everybody in India who could not download an app, did not know how to do that, does know one thing, how to send a message on WhatsApp. And because they could send a message on WhatsApp, they could get their vaccine scheduled and now can get their vaccine certificate given to them. So I think that's pretty inclusive. And, and the last point I want to make, and then I will rest, is that India does 8 billion, by the way, 8 billion payments a month. Now, 8 billion is an unfathomable number. If you look at it, 800 crores transactions a month on UPI. If you analyze it, if you analyze it, we do about 100 billion transactions a year. 400 million Indians transact using digital payments every month has to be inclusive. It is all across the pyramid. In fact, the poorest of the poor use it more than you and me because we are using it for e-commerce and e-tailing, whereas they are using it for remittances, which saves them money. So digital technology in India so is Gupta, actually... There is absolutely no doubt about the benefits of the digital technologies or the Indians reaping the benefit of it. But the challenge remains with the digital media or the media and its digital arm and having its impact on the society. And here I want, uh, Ajay Saima is here, who's with her Purani jeans. <laughs> and uh, so Saima, if you have any view on the thing, the, on one side we are all reaping the benefits of the digital technology, but as a society, are we becoming more inclusive or there have been debate about uh, the algorithm driven echo chambers. So where do we stand because the radio was the traditionally old social media and we have uh, you know, lived that age of uh, old radio listener clubs. So from that age to this age, where do you see the landscape moving towards? Thank you so much for having me here and uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, I belong to the medium which I officially call the first social media uh, of the world, radio. And uh, from radio to, you know, all the different social media platforms today. One thing that I would absolutely agree with Mr. Arvind is that 100% it is a much more inclusive world. I think this entire digital revolution has given um, every single person in our society a voice, a platform to put uh, his or her voice forward and... Um, uh, connect in his or her own chosen community. So I think uh, that's, that's definitely there. 100%, yes, everything has its perils. I think uh, as a society, while we have this platform which is giving a uh, hugely inclusive you know, opportunity to all, I mean, look at our TikTok stars and look at the strata they belong to. They could become stars in front of the world without, you know, without the, the, the traditional struggle that they would have had to actually go through. But I think um, it is a challenge and we'll have to see that the input that we have as far as information, knowledge, awareness is concerned, that's less and the output is more. The base of connecting the consciousness with which, the responsibility with which we should be connecting with each other, the knowledge and the education, that is less. The sense of responsibility that comes with it, that is less. And the output, the will to uh, connect, the will to display, the will to go viral, the will to go popular, uh, at the cost of anything, sensationalism, fake news, is going up. So the challenge is absolutely clear. How do we build 
a digital world where each one of us also inculcate that sense of responsibility and go in the right direction of a responsible society. Thank you very much. Uh, you actually rightly pointed out that uh, every technology comes with its own set of regulation, also the set of responsibilities. And here I want uh, Nankupal Rajan, you are leading uh, a very dynamic newsroom of Indian Express and its digital arm and like uh, we all follow Indian Express on, on the digital platform on, on various uh, things of yours, are especially the explainers, I'm really fond of that. Uh, but people, lot of, uh, people talk a lot, lot about the social media and social media often drives and dominates when we, people talk about the digital media, but something great is being done by the traditional media, the mainstream media, in content curation, to fact checking, putting across, and reflecting the real picture of the society. But what are your challenges in, in a newsroom, especially as a responsible media, and you know, reflecting the impact on the society, uh, when the things are often driven by algorithm or the, the clickbait journalism, and when the virtuality is becoming the reality? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> so uh, I would like to start by giving a little bit of context and I think because I've covered technology, especially these platforms for many years now, and I was a big votary of a lot of these platforms for many years, I still am in a way, but uh, I would also, uh, I've also seen how they've evolved and how they have impacted the society. So if you look at it, um, you know, this big surge we had in people coming online, you know, because of the very cheap data and the very affordable smartphones that India has. Um, and it's been happening for about four or five years now. And we had millions, of, in fact, hundreds of millions of people who came online for the first time in the past five years. And they came in without a lot of context of the internet, you know, and, and we had maybe, you know, uh, actually run out of people who had the context of the, of the internet, people who look at their mail and see inbox and understand the word inbox comes from something which was very physical once upon a time. Right, a lot of people who did not have context of computers, for instance, because they just use smartphones. Now, what also happened is that a lot of these platforms, uh, you know, which were maybe there for communication or messaging, and also ended up being uh, hardcore consumption platforms for a lot of people, because you know maybe they were not even literate enough to you know type or have a conversation, but they were consuming content. And I remember for WhatsApp, for instance, a lot of people joined groups where they were just sitting and consuming content. You look into any WhatsApp group, you will see that not more than maybe 15, 20% actually have conversations on those groups, which are like full to the limit. No, others don't, they just consume. But it also meant that a lot of people were consuming news, uh, which did not, uh, you know, uh, of course, digital media and internet and social media democratized content. It made everybody a journalist, but then, you know, you also took away the editors the people who were filtering the content so that like you know a lot of content even if it is true maybe it's not put out because of you know people taking a call that it could have a negative social impact you know those kind of calls were not being taken and of course they're uh, uh, also brought in a lot of eyeball content which doesn't have to be true right people are creating content just because you are chasing likes and that's the only thing or you're chasing revenue because there is an ad funded model you can cater to with any kind of content so, you know, so all of that, uh, you know, um, I think it's been a few years of that. Uh, we are maybe coming down that uh, peak of that kind of content uh, because I think our, our audiences are finally maturing. They are also realizing that some things are maybe not as true as they are being touted out to be and not everybody can be trusted. And I think that is also the opportunity for, uh, you know, old school media where people actually come to verify things. But the problem is that there is a lot of content which anybody can put out and anybody can accept or assimilate without that filter going in. Yeah, absolutely. Really, uh, thank you for this great insight. And like, uh, I, I completely agree with you on that, on that count that, uh, like, you know, we really have to think about that where this thing is leading towards. But uh, let me move on to the new, uh, to, the, uh, to the other side of the topic, and re I want uh, Mr. Vijay Chatha to have his comment on, uh, you have seen the transition of, of like, you have witnessed uh, almost uh, major part of India's journey in the last 75 years, and uh, while communic having the challenge of communication of from, while serving at the frontiers of India, to leading some kind of a campaign for the ambient air quality. You have seen this entire journey. But at a time when India is rapidly urbanizing with over 
we have a lot of challenges coming up. So how do you see, is digital media or the digital, digitized uh, media dissemination or information dissemination really coming as a help? Or how do you see this transition as? Are we becoming more chaotic? Sorry for I'm being repetitive on this count, but uh, I really want to ha have a uh, comprehension of your views on that. So, so Pranay, I think, uh, thank you for you know, uh, giving me this opportunity. I think I need to put things in perspective. I'm, I'm neither media nor am I a digital expert. All I have with me is 51 years of work experience. I joined the National Defense Academy in 1968 as a professional soldier, as a colonel in 92 and I retired. I came into the corporate world and uh, held leadership positions in, in uh, large multinationals. And, uh, so, and I saw, I've seen the world changing, right? And I moved to the social sector in 2008, right? When I joined Bharti Airtel as CEO of Bharti Foundation. So, I mean, there are many here who are born in the 90s. So, so in 92, when, when I came into business, right, uh, one of the businesses that I ran was DHL. It's a Korea Express company, growing phenomenally, right? And we were opening offices almost every week. Right? And I was responsible for North India. One of the reasons why we couldn't open offices was because we couldn't get telephone connections. You couldn't get a telephone connection in those days, right? So it hampered business, it hampered everything. So that was the world. Right? So from there we came to a place where we started getting telephones, right? Then suddenly mobile telephony came in. And then, you know, at almost the same time in the mid 90s, you got onto emails, right? But even then when we started emails, right? I worked for a multinational, we were a JV, right? So people used to send emails and I said, yeah, yeah, I'll check it tomorrow. Right, so that was the world. So today you expect a response immediately, right? So you came to that, then we had something called Y2K when the century was changing, right? 2008 when I joined Bharti, I used to attell, attend all the Airtel leadership conclave. So that's when I got a little exposure to digital and mobile, mobile the mobile world. You know? yeah. Even that has changed phenomenally, right? I mean, when I think back, I, I just can't imagine that this is how the world has has transitioned, right, in my 51 years of work life. I'm fortunate that I'm working, 92 when I came into the corporate world, everyone said, Colonel, I sir, bolo isko. And now when I run a foundation, I have youngsters working for me, kids who are a little older than my grandson, say, hi Vijay, can I, can I come and see you? I say, sure, yeah. So that's how the world has changed. Just the perspective, the subject is actually the impact of digital media on, on the social sector, right? So, so I spent almost 15 years in the social sector, largely in education, in Bharti Foundation, where we built 250 schools and villages, and we ran them and worked with over 1,000 government schools. Last three and a half years, I've been running a foundation which works on air pollution. I must share that, you know, problem jo hai, that I'll come to that in the end, but I think the digital media has been a lifesaver, right, in terms of its social impact. We don't know what we would have done, right? We all know what happened during COVID. Right? All these schools, I, I also happen to be chairman of Modern School Barakamba Road. Right? So I've seen that transition even the most uh, premier schools as to how people had to change over to use of digital media to even to impart basic education. I think it's a blessing and a boon. Right? A lot of people talk about the various other issues around impact of digital media. But without that, I think survival would have been difficult. Right, like it has been said, you know, I, I was also amazed at, at our nation and our country. The strength that we have as a nation, the power that we have as a nation, right? Where now almost every family has a phone, how those phones were shared. Even in my modern school, you have 25% EWS children. Bharti Foundation, everyone is in villages, right? As to how people adapted to using digital media in terms of education. For the social sector, I ran foundations. We always need money. We raise money. The ability to raise money by using digital media, the ability to convey the work that you're doing to the world, that this is what it is, right? To take, to take things to remote areas, right? Connect remotest of areas to a donor sitting in the US to say, look, this is what is happening to the child sitting in a small village in Jharkhand because of the money that you sent to adopt the school. I mean, look at the power of digital media. 
Even this foundation that, that I work in, Air Pollution Action Group, we started this in uh, June of 2019, right? But in April 2019, along with the elections, a colleague of mine who was also the marketing director of Airtel, Mohit Piotra, he ran a campaign to say, for the elections in Delhi, you know, let's do little clips to say, pollution ka kya plan hai? Right? So we ran that digital media campaign, which was funded by Ashish Dhawan, my sponsor, you know, cost about 40, 50 lakhs at that time. I mean, we got about 30, 40 lakh views. A toll-free number which was set up. Then we said, yes, I mean, people are concerned about pollution. So let's do something about it. Right? Today, we are working in five states. Without digital media, I don't know how we would carry on with our work. We have a lot of funders and sponsors with whom we use digital media to, you know, uh, to get money from them, to tell them what we are doing, to make our work more effective, right? So I think it's, it's, it's a great boon, especially in education. I mean, the changes which have happened, the transformation, it was not a one-time thing just to take care of COVID. Yeah. I think it has now become a, a part of education, right? So now you have people say, oh, that's online, we are offline. So I'll just tell them, no, no. You know, what is offline is actually online. That's real education in the classroom. Right, but what we call online, that is an add-on, right? Yeah, definitely. And, and COVID has actually uh, transformed it. Uh, the, absolutely. The online yeah. curve, education and consumption. So we are still in the learning curve. I think yeah. there's much more to be done, but I think I'll stop my comments here. Sorry learning for is a journey. telling learning. you my life history, but <laughs> yeah, obviously. And as being said, like you know, learning is a journey. We we learn all the, through our lives. But uh, I'll take the cue from what you said, like you know, the connectivity between a U.S. donor and a Indian development initiative has actually improved and here comes uh, Arjuna Vyas who also comes with a unique philanthropic experience uh, and uh, she works with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation so we all know that uh, which foundation this is and who has promoted it so there also comes a responsibility and challenge Arjuna about the tech giants on one side the organizations we all talk, talk about these tech giants their roles their algorithms and on the other side, the developmental initiative. So in the COVID times, on one side, definitely it is there that we all have got the benefit, which Arvind Gupta has mentioned, or Saima, or, or like Vijay Chadha has mentioned about it. But on the other side, how, do we have capability to contain this, you know, the business model or the algorithm-driven technologies or the tech giants? They have becoming a parallel economies. And our, now our societies, our lives are being controlled by these algorithms. So where comes the balance? So um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Hmm. Uh, maybe the mic. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I don't know how much do people know about Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but the foundation has been working in India for 20 years. Um, the focus really is, for, so first of all, the fundamental belief of the foundation is that all lives should have equal value and everybody should have a chance of leading a healthy and productive life. Um, the foundation has been working in India for about 20 years now. And uh, Bill and Melinda actually come from a fundamental belief that if they had the wealth, they wanted that wealth to be given away to improve lives of people. Um, so we work in the area of health, urban sanitation, agriculture productivity, gender as well as um, you know other other areas that can help solve for problems uh, the question that you posed in terms of technology and tech giants and their responsibility i think first of all uh, i would like to say is technology is today all pervasive um, that's why we are in this forum uh, today talking about its benefits but also responsibility in terms of uh, how um, you know with rapid explosion of technology, um, the regulation also has to catch up with it, right? Because uh, what's happened is the fact that um, government, society, people, private sector, um, perhaps are, are not keeping uh, in pace with uh, when it comes to, to regulation and governance um, in, in pace with how the technology is actually moving forward. At the foundation, we look at technology for solving people's issues, right? Because um, it's not necessarily saying, okay, we will look at only technology-based solutions only because Bill comes from that background. It's not one size that fits all kind of uh, an approach. 
but definitely we think that technology can bridge certain gaps. Uh, the areas that I spoke about, which is either in the case of agriculture, we know that uh, you know, India is an agrarian agri society, uh, the contribution to GDP is about 18%, 40% of labor force actually comes from agriculture, but about 70% of um, the, the workforce is actually small land holding farmers. Um, and and about in India, at least yeah. about 50 to 90% inefficiency creeps in because uh, they're using either uh, primitive tools um, and, and therefore the production can actually yield can be made better hmm. if technology and its solutions were made available and those tools were made available to the farmers. Mm -hmm. um, I think for the past five years, uh, there's been huge infusion of, um, of funding in agri-tech. And we're excited with that because I think um, if you look at the broad so you're funding the agri-tech in terms of the uh, information dissemination, reaching out to the farmers? Uh, no. Or, or how uh, are you so, so some of the solutions mm. that we are uh, funding is improving their productivity and not necessarily, but mm. also mm. information di dissemination because they do not have the right kind of information, they do not have market access, mm -hmm. and if the tools can be predictive so that they're able to look at, uh, you know, effects of climate change, Mm -hmm. to be able to build for that resilience and to be able to look at their produce and yield uh, accordingly, then uh, definitely it helps the farmer. And I think uh, what, you know, likewise, you know, we've spoken about benefits in health, we've spoken about benefits in financial inclusion. I think the last area that I would want to talk about is if more and more digital access can be provided to women, uh, that can really change. Uh, it can have fantastic change as far as society is concerned. Uh, we are about 50% of the population, of but there are, the there are still limitations in, in terms of digital access to women. One is because of literacy. Uh, the second thing is, uh, so because they're not as, as educated, right? Because they're prevented from going to school. Um, at the same time, digital literacy, then digital literacy becomes an issue. Uh, there are social norms that prevail as well. Woman is taken as primary, you know, she's, she's going to take care of, of the household, right? Um, as well as there are not enough women in STEM, in science, engineering, uh, and medical. So if the uh, one that the government is doing a lot, our Honorable Prime Minister has spoken about women-led development, um, and there is definite... Um, belief as well as action in terms of how can we we make change happen for women. So I think that's another Definitely. area. It, it remains a challenge for our economy also to how to increase the participation of women and like uh, in last one decade we have seen the data which is suggesting like you know the participation of women has gone down right. which is a really uh, a challenge for us. But uh, yeah I want Shreya you to to come in and you are a unique example of a COVID era entrepreneurship model also, the content creator economy, which has come up as a parallel economy, and especially, it's, it's largely a very encouraging sign that the, the women are, uh, like especially the, those who are staying at home, or the girls, are exploring that possibility, and it is uh, high revenue generating right now. But what has been your experience? And since everybody is talking about some kind of a regulation, what is your perspective? Because you are the youngest one on the, on, on the dais. Uh, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me here. And before I deep dive into uh, the pointers that you've mentioned, I would want to clarify some of the points that I think uh, came across in the panel. So there's this idea that, uh, you know, the sensationalization of information is happening and this eyeball journalism. While all of that is true, I think just holding content creators accountable is not okay. Because I think the fact that these things are going viral shows the fact that that's something that the society is consuming more of. So I think it's echoing the society sentiment more than just the content creators will, uh, first and foremost. Not to say that content creators are not responsible, but yeah, I have to speak up for my clan. That being said, I think uh, there is not all bad. There have been good things that have come out of digitization and of especially around the COVID era. The fact that 10.7 million uh, DMAT accounts were open, especially in the last two years, which was sort of record-breaking, and I'm sure a lot of people in the room here started their investing journey probably in the past two years, if not sooner. So the idea is that it's not all bad. I think a 
a very big reason why that also happened was because of social media. I think because there was, again, as Saima said, democratization of information and everybody was able to speak up about things they were passionate about, no matter where they came from, no matter uh, what their beliefs were, no matter the language, right? Uh, as Sohila mentioned that even if you speak in a vernacular language, it's completely fine because you will find your tribe. I think that's something that social media uh, brought to the platforms that no matter what, no matter the language you speak, no matter how you look, you will find people who believe and look similar to you and have similar beliefs as you do. Now, coming back to your question, you mentioned that regulations are very essential. And I don't think that we should shy away from this. I think because this space is still sort of figuring out what it is, it's very new in comparison to, say, radio or television, for instance, I think we are still struggling to figure out, okay, how do we regulate certain things? To give you an example, uh, when you see an ad on television, you know that's an ad. But when you see, on, see an ad on social media, specifically, say, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, a lot of the times you won't even get to know that's an ad, right? Whether it's an ad or whether it's a personal opinion of the creator, you never really get to know about that. So I think stricter regulations around that is something that's need of the hour. And it's already in progress as we speak. Uh, a lot of brands now are very proactive, specifically in the finance niche, that no, you have to make it very clear that whatever you say is from a promotional perspective and does not show the opinions of the brand or the creator themselves. And doing your own research is the need of the hour. So that being said, I think uh, social media, while we all know, has a very negative uh, connotation to it, especially uh, uh, in the millennials and the Gen Z uh, segment. But what I do want to say is that it's not all bad. As I said, there's always two sides to the story. And whatever is happening on social media is actually a very big indication of what the society as an average and as a whole wants. So yeah. Definitely, yeah. Uh, I think uh, Arvind Gupta can add to this thing. And uh, But uh, like the challenge remains that those who are emerging as a social media influencers, how influenced are they? What is the parameter to evaluate that? And uh, th this could be out of ignorance also. But how it become a challenge for the governance, how it becomes challenge for the regulation, and when government try and regulate it, there is generally a resistance from those who are being regulated about it. So what's your perspective since you have worked with the government also and like uh, you are CEO of the, of the, of the, the MyGov, it was a citizen initiative, but like a lot, uh, lot of ideas come to you, then people want a participation in any democracy. So what's your take on that? So Pranay, uh, uh, thank you. Two things, uh, two very quick, two, three quick points. Mm -hmm. Number one, uh, MyGov uh, is uh, a digital platform of the Prime Minister, uh, which, is, uh, which leads with uh, public participation. So, you know, where the voice of, the, um, uh, of every Indian um, of course, using analytics can be heard. Uh, we, we get so much responses. Um, you talk about civic participation. The Indian Postal Bank that you have heard of is a creation of an idea that came from my cup, right? Even the whole Jandhan movement, this Jandhan accounts, India has done 46 crore Jandhan accounts, more, twice more than the population of America, by the way, right? Uh, that name Jandhan came through my cup. The sign of the rupee came through MyGov at a 50,000 rupee cost, not a 50 lakh rupee cost of hiring a design agency and doing it. So it's all, you know, public participation, number one. Two, you talk about influencers. I think this is where India is going to lead the world mm -hmm. in two things. And this is a very important um, topic because two things have happened. First of all, we don't have TikTok influencers in India because we don't have TikTok in India. You call them that category, but I just wanted to clarify, we don't have any Chinese platforms, hopefully. But we have Insta influencers. Uh, yeah, call them Insta influencers or social media influencers. Yeah. Second thing is, within this, you know, I think India will be one of the biggest content factories of the world. And as we go towards that, the, we need to balance between what is, as you said, and what, uh, you know, what uh, my co-panelists have said, on what is really the content that you want to give out of your own personal belief and faith and what is sponsored content, uh, what could be as really influenced either by money or gifts or awards. We don't know what the thing behind it is because of the nature, especially of the nature of the consumption in India. Everybody has talked about India has reached 850 million, 85 crore users. We understand the literacy levels in that, whether it's financial literacy, digital literacy, vaccine literacy, 
can all be very, very diverse, as diverse as you can imagine. So if two social media influencers stand up and uh, start saying the vaccines gave them instead of two, three years, and uh, because of XYZ, I mean, it could be many, many things, and you know what all has been sent against the vaccines or, or whatever else, it actually creates a much, much big trickle-down effect, very big trickle-down effect. Mm. So I think, uh, same thing, we've had instances of influencers gathering money from senior citizens and putting it in their own personal accounts and just, uh, you know, uh, disappearing in the virtual space because that itself was a... So we have to balance and as we go forward, we'll have to come out with better regulation. So far the regulation is a very self-regulatory environment where advertisements, uh, the Advertising Council of India has put some certain restrictions, really not enforced. But as we go forward, I feel this is an area where will the industry will have to work with the algorithms, the algorithms means the platforms, with the influencers and, and the... Um, and the, and the citizen rights groups to, understand, to make sure that there is a balance between the three. We don't kill uh, innovation, we don't kill the industry, but we also make sure the consumer is protected. You and lastly, I want to just leave yeah. uh, with a thought that, um, you know, uh, and this is the motherhood statement. Everybody in the G20 year where India has a presidency mm. is looking at what India does. Gone are the eras where, um, and I know you have a session with ADIF in the, in the afternoon, uh, gone is the era where uh, some algorithms sitting in Silicon Valley where I worked for 20 years are going to dictate what happens in India. And what, how India regulates its digital media, how India regulates big tech. Um, and I know the Honorable MP from Australia is here, Paul Fletcher, uh, I uh, saw him somewhere. And um, you know, this is what India will do now gets a global voice. Um, whether it's the content industry or it's the fake news industry or it is big tech or algorithms or the competitive, uh, the anti-competitive powers that all these platforms have, India is at, at, uh, in the eye of the global world to say, hey, let's understand what India is saying. Because not only we are, we are doing the right thing from a bottom-up approach, but we have the highest user base. It's high time that we get our voice also. So. Shay, you want to add something? Yeah. Yeah, just one quick point. While I completely agree with what Sir said, especially around the fact that India is such a big market, also because it's such a diverse market, right? Like every language, like uh, every vernacular language is a market in itself, which I think isn't true for a lot of major economies. That being said, uh, I do believe there's an increase of scams and like fake news, as Sir mentioned. And especially around the crypto space when it comes to finance, right? Because again, that's a fairly unregulated market. Uh, so in the past couple of uh, years, we've noticed that the NFT scam, the bubble came around, right? Uh, the crypto bubble came around, stuff like that. Uh, largely unregulated, and there were a lot of influencers that became a part of it and sort of supported it wholeheartedly. But that being said, I think the other side of the story is that such Ponzi scheme have always existed. Like, from time immemorial, we've always had such bubbles come around from like 90, 1890s since the tulip uh, bubble came around, right? So we've had Ponzi schemes come around since forever. But I think because of social media and the impact it has on society now, there's a larger discourse around these issues, which I think is even more important. Scams aren't a thing that came around in 2020. They've been here forever. But I think there's a discussion around it now. If there's an overvalued IPO, there's a higher uh, probability that people will discuss about it and that there'll be discourse around it and people will, you know, voice their opinions because now even they have a platform to sort of voice their opinions and not just bigger corporations and, you know, bigger stars. So I think that's where social media is impacting Definitely. truly it, it be seen. It is a challenging part of uh, the digital landscape that like, you know, the financial implication of it, scams are there, people are losing money out of it. And uh, definitely there comes the responsibility to explain people that where they should be putting and there comes the responsibility for the regulators also, like RBI, like SEBI and other people also. But there is also security implications. Uh, and uh, I want Mr. Vijay Chadha to uh, have a quick comment on this issue. Uh, since you come with a unique experience of having served in the military uh, forces also. We have seen during the Galwan crisis uh, uh, and as a journalist, we have seen that how a, a, a map, a satellite imagery coming from US or a, or a technology platform, changing the dynamics of it, giving like every day deployment scenario of it, it actually brings a challenge for India to having uh, taken the negotiation with, with China, resolving the issue and where, uh, like, you know, uh, making an impression that the government is hiding something and something has happened. How do you see this? 
aspect of it, it's an open domain, uh, a US platform set, sharing the satellite imagery and having implications on our ecosystem. No, I think this is a very major issue, like you said, and, and it's become an integral part of the armed forces strategy today, right? Mm -hmm. If you've heard the Northern Army commander, I think a couple of days ago, he made a press statement that what is going to drive future wars is going to be technology, right? It's something that we can't be, you know, uh, oblivious to. It has to be integrated. We have to be prepared to face all the challenges which technology brings. It gives us a lot of benefits, right? It gives us a lot of information, how we're going to use it. Of course, the political part of it and how the media handles it, that's a different domain altogether, right? Because uh, there are some things, like when I was in the army, we felt that, you know, uh, we were something special and what was inside the army could not be discussed outside. The world, like I said, is no longer the same, right? Everything is transparent. Like you see, the satellites there, they know everything that we don't know, right? So Let me tell you, it, it took us uh, many years to make the Army headquarters and ADGPI to understand that, like, you know, TV has a different need, social media has a different need. Right. Uh, you're, you're rightly pointed so, out. So, so I think, I, I yeah. think mm. the armed forces needs to change. Yeah. They have to adapt, right? Mm. It is in their own interest because it will also help our national security. We've got to meet all these threats. We can only handle these threats if you're actually aware of what is happening, you're transparent, you're willing to listen, right? And you're willing to be changing continuously. You know, what changed once in 20 years is now probably changing every hour. The world is changing so fast, right? So, so it is integral. It has to be taken cognizance of. But do we have to deal with this challenge? Sorry? Do we have to deal with this challenge like uh, every now and then? No, I think, I think it's being dealt with. I, you know, and I think uh, feel secure. You've got the best, one of the best armies in the world Actually, is the Indian Army. you want to add something to it? Uh, not specifically to the defense issue, but mm. related mm. is misdisinformation, right? So that's what we're discussing uh, at this point in time, that it has an impact in terms of society. It has an... So let's look at the COVID scenario. One, the fact that everybody in India has... 90% of us have got double dose. Mm. Now, this happened only because uh, there was a conscious... Um, there was consciousness ahead of time that misdisinformation can play a role. That was a big part of government strategy in terms of, you know, there can, be, there can be vaccine hesitation, but there can also be vaccine eagerness. But hesitation was, was a big uh, issue that was handled proactively. Mm -hmm. And to that extent, I think tackling misdisinformation, there's a lot of work that's happening globally by academics in terms of understanding how it can be tackled. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there was willingness, uh, so, you know, we approach the big, big tech, right? The source of misdisinformation, we know that can come from Meta, it can come from Google, it can come from other sources as well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at that point in time, those big platforms also realized that they have responsibility and they did come forward, I, I have to say that. But media also played an extremely responsible role. Media came forward to debunk media came forward to actually disseminate accurate information. So I, I, I think uh, that if different, the stakeholders understand their own responsibility, but also look at, um, you know, uh, one, one is responsibility. Um, there is huge amount of work that's happening in terms of debunking uh, myths. Uh, there is academic work that's happening. So I, I, I still think that there is hope. It, it, it's not about, but oh, there's so there, much there, there is yeah. a hope. There is hope. Uh, but I think Saima wanted to add something. And Saima, if, uh, uh, if you can take forward this argument that definitely tech giants or the digital regulators have their own responsibilities. But by the time they step in, something has damaged within the society because society bears the impact of it. So uh, if you can... I think it's pretty simple, you know. Uh, Digital world or digital revolution today is like fire. Hmm. You, we either learn how to cook food with it hmm. or the fire can destroy. So I think our different departments, areas have to work together. As a country, we need to have huge emphasis on education, literacy, awareness. We need to have the same kind of revolution in education department. While we have the digital revolution, we know how to optimize on the digital revolution because everything goes viral, everything happens rapidly, there is no time. So we as a country, as a nation, must know how to optimize on the digital revolution, rather, you know, go towards the destruction. And that can also happen, 
you know, as quickly as we kind of progress. Any quick comment, Nangopal Rajan, like uh, as Simon yeah, said. So, yeah. uh, I'll just add on that, uh, that this awareness level of the country as a whole needs to go up. That this is not something you can will away, this is the future. We are living in this digital uh, you know, era and you know, I, you know, I just keep telling kids and all that like if smartphones have made all of us journalists, now is the time to become editors too. So please don't you know, share anything saying as received on, on WhatsApp. Please don't share unless you are very sure about it. And, if that level of self-regulation comes into every single person, then a lot of the virality for the wrong content will go away on its own. Thank you very much. Uh, and this was really a very interesting discussion. And as Nangopal has finally uh, concluded it, that if you really want to become journalist, yes, you have power of this digital technology in your hands in the form of your smartphone. But please try and be good editors also and use your own discretion before putting out something or before consuming something. Thank you very much uh, for, the, for the panel and have a round of applause for our panel. Thank you and a round of